just providing a quick um, snapshot of uh, some of the issues that we're seeing um, and some of the trend lines. And then also we wanted to um, go through some specific topics. We've received a number of questions that we've tried to group into uh, themes. And we will be talking about um, the issue of fraud, uh, an update on some of the federal programs. Um, we've received a number of questions about where are we at in the hiring, what does that look like, and um, what are our intentions. We received a number of questions about contractors, who do we have contracts with, and what kind of work are they performing. Um, there are a couple of questions that we've also received that we've kind of grouped in the, as the state reopens, what are some things that people need to be aware of? And, uh, and last night we started getting a number of questions about BIW and uh, the, the workers who are out on strike. So uh, that's pretty much the framework that we're going to use this morning. Um, of course, you can uh, use the chat feature to ask additional questions, and uh, there are some people who are on the phone will also make time to, uh, to get, their, get their input as well um, by pausing and asking uh, for those folks to ask questions. So that's pretty much the format that we're going to be using over the next hour. And uh, Jess, can we kind of jump into it and put the slide up there? And I hope everybody is able to see it. We'll also make this slide available uh, after uh, the presentation today. Uh, I'd probably post it sure. on our website um, for people to have access to, as well as I, I, Isaac can also make it available to anybody who wants it um, individually. So we just wanted to kind of put out um, a kind of a quick overview of what we were seeing. So the graph that you, and I apologize to the people who are on the phone, um, we can make sure that we, we get information to you if you want it, if you want this particular um, slide, and we will only be using the one slide, so there, it's not a series. So the graph that you see on there is just, um, to show the number of initial claims that we have uh, received since the beginning of the year. And as you can clearly see, there was an enormous spike beginning on March 16th. It kept going up uh, rapidly from 623, I mean 634 initial claims to over 21,000, followed by 23, almost 24,000. And it peaked at um, almost 31,000 initial claims per week, the week of um, April 6th. Since then, uh, it has gradually decreased until in mid-May, we saw another dramatic increase in the number of initial claims to almost um, 16 and a half thousand initial claims. And that was the kind of inflection point um, that we've talked about before where we um, started suspecting that there were fraudulent claims. And that was based on both the numbers that we were seeing as well as information that we were receiving from across the country. So again, this is just to try to put some of these numbers in perspective. Um, as of June 20th, uh, we had received about 162,000 initial claims for the state unemployment insurance program. 
and an additional 42, uh, 72,000 initial pandemic unemployment insurance claims. So we try to track those two um, separately because I know initially it caused some confusion about, or people have particular questions about each of the programs. <clears throat> As of uh, last week, um, about uh, 82 and a half percent of all claimants had received their state unemployment benefits. If you were on this meeting last week with us, last week that uh, rate was 82 per, 80 percent, so we've gone up 2.5 percent, and we continue to try to work as quickly as possible uh, to get um, to process claims and get those benefits out to people. As we said last week, um, we're trying to um, identify like where does Maine fit in the scheme of things. And, uh, you know, Nevada uh, has uh, paid out about somewhere between 50 and 70%, Arizona about 50% of the claims. Um, and we are aspiring and doing our best to uh, continue to increase our processing rates so that we are able to at least meet, if not exceed, uh, the levels in Michigan and Maryland, which are in the 90 percent percentile. Um, the total paid to claimants from all programs, so again, the state unemployment as well as the federal programs, was about $75 million uh, last week. And that brings the total that has been sent out to um, to people, uh, claimants, um, to $882 million since the beginning of the pandemic. And the, the reason that that's important is because the unemployment insurance program is supposed to do two things. One, it's supposed to help individuals during an economic crisis kind of tide them over while they're looking for um, new employment, but it's also helping the community that they live in and serving as an economic stabilizer. Um, so Kim, I don't know if you wanted to sure. add anything in here. Sure. Um, we also mentioned last week that, you know, we had the highest um, week on week increase in initial claims and the third highest increase in continued claims um, as of June 11th for that, for that particular time period. So we were seeing, like the commissioner said, we were attributing a lot of that to the, the fraud and we've seen it um, roll out in waves across the country. And that was the particular week where we got hit hard with the fraud. So, um, so that's what we'd like to jump in and talk a little bit about now. So we continue to work with um, our state and federal partners on addressing fraud. Uh, and we are doing uh, weekly press releases about what we're seeing. And uh, this morning we announced that we canceled about 1,900 initial claims and about 4,300 weekly certifications because of suspected fraud. Um, I think as I mentioned last week, what we're doing is we're using uh, um, information from other states as well as from national, um, uh, the National Data Hub, Integrity Hub, to help us identify what some of those potential fraudulent flags are. Our goal is twofold. It is to continue to pay um, benefits to people who are legitimate and eligible as quickly as possible. And at the same time, we have the responsibility to make sure that we do everything possible to prevent fraudulent um, uh, from fraudsters, criminals, basically, from being paid money that they should not um, they should not receive. So, uh, from May 30th through June 20th, we've canceled roughly 23 thousand um, initial claims and roughly 41,000 weekly certifications. Um, additionally, uh, we've provided ways for legitimate um, Maine people to uh, have their claims reinstated. And we have been working, as I had mentioned, with the Department of Corrections uh, and on that. And at the end of last week, 
Um, the submissions that we had received through last week had been up to date. I think we have about uh, 200 at this point that have we've received this week that we're right. in the process of processing. Yeah. And we've reinstated about 9,700 right, um, people who have sent in information. We have received over 24,000 individual reports of suspected fraud. We know that some of those are duplicated because we had both the employer and the individual report it, but the still 24,000 different instances, uh, different reports that we've followed up on. And I think that's also um, important to, to recognize um, that, you know, this, um, the stories that we hear from individuals whose claims are being impacted by this are heart-wrenching and uh, we take that very seriously and we do everything humanly possible to expedite uh, these claims and reinstate them. We also know, as the Deputy Commissioner pointed out, that we had received 24,000 complaints from Maine people saying that their identity was being used fraudulently. Now that may have been, again, duplicates, um, but we know this is a serious issue. We are treating it seriously. Uh, and we're trying to achieve both of those goals of paying people um, who should be receiving benefits as quickly as possible and at the same time doing everything that we can uh, to put barriers in place so that this money uh, is not um, getting into the hands of criminals. And we are continuing to work with law enforcement um, across the country, both state and federal law enforcement to, to do those pieces. Um, a couple of the things that we did um, was to stop the, the self-service backdating of claims. It certainly still is possible to, to backdate a claim. Uh, if you call our 800 number, you'll have to talk with a customer service representative in order to do that. The other thing that we've done is reinstated what is typically our um, 10 to 14 day hold before we start paying out on benefits. This is uh, during normal times we do this. We send out information to both the individual and to the employer asking them to verify the details of the separation and, and gather some wages if that's needed. Um, we had waived that during this pandemic so that we could get benefits out the door faster. Um, and that was to our detriment that week that the fraud hit. So we have reinstated that 10-day that hold. So now it's 10 to 14 days from when you submit your initial claim if there are no issues for your payments to start flowing. Right. And again, as... Um, as Deputy Commissioner said, backdating is still available. Um, so we want to make sure that people do receive any retroactive payments that they're eligible for, but that must be done by having a conversation with a claims representative. The other thing is that the um, uh, unexpected imposter fraud uh, caused was it derailed some of our efforts to uh, roll out additional federal programs. Um, you know, as we've mentioned on a number of occasions, we had very limited staffing as, um, as we went into this pandemic, and the same people uh, who are working to put um, uh, those flags and filters in place um, on our computer system are the same people that we need to use to design and implement uh, some of the federal programs. We had planned to have the pandemic um, emergency unemployment compensation program up several weeks ago. Uh, I know many of you are anxious about this and uh, we will be rolling that program out next week. In the meantime, uh, what we did was we put um, people who, um, we believe will be rolling into the PEUC program into the pandemic unemployment assistance program. Um, because again, our goal is to make sure that we are getting benefits into the hands of people and we will uh, transition some of those people um, who are eligible into PEUC uh, over the next um, uh, coming days, so through next week. Uh, the other program that um, has been delayed is the uh, financial verification for self-employed people. Um, our goal had been to um, 
get again get benefits out to people get them the um the weekly benefit and the six hundred dollars that they would be eligible for um and so the uh benefit amount that they were eligible for was the basic benefit of 172 dollars plus the 600. And that we, was the easiest way for us to get it out is everybody got the 172 and we didn't have to wait for uh, wage verifications these are usually folks that we don't have wages for in our system so we did set that level at 172 again as the commissioner said plus the six hundred dollars a week uh, we had originally said that by the end of may we would request that information um, obviously we are here mid-june uh, we will be coming out um, with an announcement on that soon um, but originally we had said we would be requesting wage information from everyone but we have um, been working with our counterparts at Maine Revenue in order to be able to um, get a, a feed into our system. So we're thinking uh, roughly about half of the people who are self-employed may not need to submit that documentation. But those who do, we will be reaching out to them. Right. And again, this was a way of trying to streamline the process for people and not have um, people needing to submit information if we could access that information from a different source and that we would be doing uh, the redetermination uh, for those folks um, as quickly as possible. Um, and again, with as, um, as without um, requiring additional information, if it's not necessary, um, we will be reaching out to the people that we do need additional information from. And again, that's in the, the coming weeks. Um, the other question that's come up, particularly from people who are self-employed, is the issue of excessive earnings. And again, um, there is uh, the normal um, maximum weekly benefit under state unemployment insurance was 445 through the end of May. As of June 1st, the maximum, week, if you filed a claim after June 1st, the maximum weekly benefit went up to $462. That only applies to initial claims for state unemployment after June 1st. Um, so when people are receiving excessive earnings determinations, it's if they have exceeded their maximum weekly benefit by more than $5. So we do know that for self-employed people, if they're only receiving the 172, it's pretty easy to get over $177 per week um, in, uh, in earnings. Those benefits, if they're eligible, will be, once their maximum weekly benefit is redetermined, um, their benefits will be retroactive. But I do want to put out there again that the maximum amount is going to be that 445 plus the $5. Um, we're seeing many people who are bringing in earnings that are significantly more than that and are. Um, even with the redetermination, they would still exceed the maximum weekly benefit and not be eligible during th that week uh, for unemployment insurance benefits. The parameters are, and that includes the $600 as well, you must be eligible for at least $1 in unemployment benefits from either the state unemployment program or one of the federal programs in order to be eligible for that additional federal pandemic unemployment compensation uh, benefit of $600. It is not an automatic um, $600. Um, I'm trying to think if there was something else about that. Um, oh, that the pandemic unemployment assistance is uh, will be expiring the week of July 25th. Um, we've received some questions about, is that definite? Is there something else that can be done? We don't know the answer to that. That's, uh, that will require congressional action. At this point in time, the information that we have is that the program ends the week of July 25th. And, and yeah, and that's the extra $600 a week ends right. with um, the week ending July 25th. Right. Um, I think there was a question about PUA rolling over and why some claimants didn't roll and what we're doing about that. 
Yeah, we began rolling people over into the PUA program at the beginning of May. It was our hopes that we could do um, one massive rollover and everybody would, would move over to that program. We know that was not the case. Um, there are unique situations with every claim. Uh, that's true under normal times and especially true now. Um, so every week we have gone through and looked at what are the unique circumstances that um, prevented the, the mass roll. And every week we are rolling more people over to the, the PUA um, program. So uh, we, we regret that it wasn't able to happen for everyone right away, um, but we are moving more people to it every week. Yeah, and um, the other thing that uh, is also happening, and I will be talking a little bit about uh, more in depth about hiring, uh, but one of the groups of people that we have hired are business analysts, and uh, we're in the process of bringing them on board um, this week, I believe. Yeah, some started this week. And uh, the business analysts are the folks who work uh, with our um, technical staff in order to deal with some of those unique situations that, that Kim mentioned. And um, it will um, allow the experienced Bureau of Unemployment Compensation project staff to focus on some of these reviews as well. Um, and uh, you know, one of the reoccurring themes that I think that, um, that you've heard from me over the past 14 weeks is the need for qualified trained staff. That is the primary bottleneck. Um, and we are bringing people on board as quickly as possible. It does take time to train people. Um, it would be wonderful if there was this pool of um, readily available, deeply experienced unemployment insurance um, staff. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. And as we bring people on board, um, there is a training component. Uh, this week, as we mentioned, we're bringing on board business analysts. Um, we also uh, onboarded last week uh, some uh, law students and recent law school graduates who went through training last week and are beginning to handle fact findings. They're going to be with us over the summer. We're doing that at the as a parallel process for hiring uh, full-time, regular, um, year-round uh, adjudicators. Um, so we're trying to do both of those things. Um, to just give a quick overview, we're in the process of adding 52 eligibility specialists, 34 claims adjudicators, 22 fraud investigators, 34 accounting specialists, and four hearing officers. Um, and that's just uh, to give you a, a snapshot. Um, the um, adjudicators are, uh, the target there is to have them focus on the fact-finding uh, backlog that, that, we're, um, that we're seeing. Um, you may remember about six weeks ago, I don't know, Kim, uh, when we released uh, the about 5,000 uh, claims that were being held for fact finding that were due to uh, um, remuneration. So these were people who had received some sort of compensation from their employers. And just like the 10 day to 14 day hold, normally what we do is we have a conversation um, between uh, with the employee, we find out what they received, we talk to the employer, we verify all of this before we make a determination. Um, but because we knew that fact findings were taking too long, what we did was we held back two weeks of benefits and um, have let the rest go and we will reconcile that at the, uh, at the time of the fact finding. But again, getting money into the hands of people who desperately needed it um, was, the, was our goal and it seemed like it was the prudent thing to do. At the fact finding, there may be some people who only received one week of um, uh, comparable um, benefit from their employer and we may owe them an ex extra week. There may also be people who received three or four weeks of um, income from their employer um, and uh, there will be overpayments in those cases. Um, we also encourage people to put accurate information when they're filing their weekly certifications. Um, we are still seeing 
people who are not filling out their weekly certifications. One of the things that we are doing is on a uh, weekly basis, we are sending emails uh, to everyone who has not filed a weekly certification and asking them to please submit their weekly certification because that's really what triggers the benefit. We're also seeing that there is a group of people who may have a filter in place on their emails. Um, and uh, we just encourage people, you know, I'm sure you see things from companies all the time that say, please include us in your contact list. Um, if you could encourage people to include us in their contact list, this may help facilitate some of the communication. Um, we, are, we were asked uh, questions about working with LL Bean and what is it that they're doing for us. Um, they have been handling the, um, uh, the initial screening and uh, first round of interviews. They completed the first round of interviews for a number of positions and we actually have reviewed their recommendations and are making some offers starting this week for the eligibility agents. So these are primarily the people who answer our telephone line. They've also um, are finishing up the accounting specialist positions who largely work in our tax and employer services area uh, and claims adjudicator positions have started. So we expect to be done with those by the end of next week. Uh, we believe that the, the offers that are being made this week, we will have staff on board starting July 13th. Um, as the commissioner said earlier, there is a lot of training involved. So um, these folks will get a, an abbreviated version of that and, and will be added to our, our phones. Um, and we will continue to provide training as we move along. And speaking of the phones, um, we've received several questions about um, the contractor that we're using. Uh, the contractor we're using is Savvy Links. Uh, they are a Maine-based contractor. They have um, an office here in uh, Brunswick, um, and they also have staff that telework in Maine and from other states as well. Um, so we brought those folks on board pretty quickly uh, and we made that decision to do it because we needed to rapidly ramp up. Uh, we do have a multi-tiered system that we use so that the initial call is someone from Savvy Links um, and then there's backup from again our 13 experienced unemployment insurance um, claims folks. Um, we, as programs change, as information changes, it's a constant learning. Um, and uh, we are trying to make sure that people have the information that they need. But the system, um, and by the system, I mean the, uh, it's almost like different, it's like a wave of different uh, questions. Initially, many of the questions were around, how do I file for unemployment? What do I do? How do I fill out the application? The questions that we're getting now are very, very different than they were 13 or 14 weeks ago. Um, and many of the questions that we're getting are very unique and specific to individual um, situations and the claims staff on the phone may not always um, be able to provide uh, answers. Uh, there are, um, I mean, there are some cases that are going to require fact finding. And I think it's important um, to remember that unemployment insurance is a, uh, a two-party um, system where you do have the employer and the employee and there are certain circumstances that do require that you get information from both of those parties before you can make a determination uh, and we are starting to um, see more and more of those kind of thorny issues emerging and um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we're bringing on board um, additional fact finders, both for the some uh, additional staff to do fact finding, both over the summer, as well as um, getting people trained up for, uh, for handling calls, uh, situations in the fall. The other question that we're getting is, uh, we already talked about L.L. Bean, uh, we're getting questions about TCS. 
and TCS is the company uh, that uh, is the vendor that um, created the Reemploy Me system. It's part of a consortium. Uh, we've received lots of questions about how do we work with the vendor? What, you know, did they just create it and go away? And are we bringing them back in? Um, we work very closely with TCS. We have our technical staff working with uh, the TCS staff and they're involved in all aspects of uh, changes that need to be made to the actual system, um, including helping us uh, in the development and uh, implementation of the PUA um, and uh, FPUC program and um, are working with us on the PEUC program and the, um, the next piece of the income uh, verification for, um, for the PUA self-employed piece. Yeah, and I just want to, all of this work is part of our ongoing maintenance contract. The TCS right. didn't install the program and then and go away. They have been uh, working with the department ever since it was uh, implemented. We received questions about, um, so what is this ticket thing that, that you do and how does that work and how many of them are there and what does it mean? Um, and so there are, uh, the ticket is the way that, that um, items are tracked through the system. If there's an issue, a ticket is created to address it. Now, some of those tickets are things that are, um, only applicable to a particular individual and others are more systemic. Um, there are roughly uh, 300 tickets a month that are submitted and about 75% of those tickets are resolved um, within the same, uh, the same month. Uh, it, again, it is a combination of our um, contractors and our uh, staff that sort through the tickets, identify the issues, and then make recommendations about what the potential solutions are. Um, all policy decisions about solutions um, come to me. And the question about how many people with uh, TCS are dedicated to working, um, on Maine specific computer systems, because again, this is part of a consortium. So uh, Maine is in the consortium with um, Mississippi, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and um, there's a possibility of one other state that we're also in conversation with. And there's a core team of 14 full-time TCS employees involved in the support, maintenance, and enhancement for the reemployment me uh, production system. And we have a staff of six MDOL folks who work with them. Um, and the kinds of things that they do are, you know, um, creating technical specifications, writing test scripts, performing user acceptance testing, you know, gathering um, requirements. And that's the work that our staff does and then works in concert with TCS. Was there anything else? About no, that. I think that was a, a good summary. Okay. Um, so we've received also, you know, questions about now that businesses are starting to reopen. What does that mean for folks who have, um, who are not able to return to work, even if their employer is reopening? Um, we're starting to hear from employers that they're trying to call their their staff back, and and some are not available um, to come back. We're starting to get reports of refusals of work. So when that happens, we do hold a fact-finding interview to determine whether or not there was good cause for not being able to return to work. And in the pandemic, there is a, a longer list of reasons that might, um, might justify a good cause. And some of those are um, your healthcare provider has advised that you continue to, to self-isolate or you're caring for somebody who has been um, affected with COVID-19. And we do have a list of those on our website. Um, so we do have to hold the fact-finding interview because if this is someone who is on state unemployment, 
they may no longer be eligible for state unemployment, but that's what the, the PUA program is for, and those expanded reasons of good cause would be, make them potentially eligible for PUA. So we have to determine, was, was there good cause, and then which program do they uh, right. receive benefits on? And related to that, um, we mentioned earlier, the extra $600 a week is expiring um, based on federal legislation with the week ending July 25th. So um, that, that re requires congressional action in order to continue that. Yeah, and I just want to get back to the, um, the state UI and the pandemic unemployment assistance. There's a requirement for um, from the federal program um, that you must constantly evaluate and see which program the person is eligible for. So as Kim said, the person may have been eligible for state unemployment assistance in the beginning um, and they may move to PUA. You can't end, there is no way to just automatically put someone in PUA without first um, doing an assessment and seeing if they are eligible for state unemployment. So it is that kind of two-step process that we constantly have to maintain um, in order to stay in compliance with the federal regulations around um, pandemic unemployment assistance. And the other thing I would add to that is we would also look for um, evidence of some conversations between the individual and their employer. Was there uh, discussions about how work might be performed in a, in a different way? Um, a different schedule is telework available, for instance, um, to, to support that good cause. It's really, there was no way for this individual to perform the work. Right. Uh, and the other thing we're starting to hear from employers is, are there things that they can be doing differently? What if they are not able to open um, completely? Are there other options? And so we're starting to have and have been having since the pandemic began, a number of conversations with employers around the work share program. Uh, and uh, when the pandemic started, we had about three employers that were using work share. We now have about 175 employers who are using work share. Uh, and what this does is it allows an employer to um, uh, reduce their workforce by anywhere from 10 to 50 percent, pay the commensurate wages, and then the employee would be able to uh, collect a partial unemployment benefit um, based on their normal, whatever their weekly benefit amount was. So let's say, let's say it was $300, and if they were working 50% uh, of the time, they would be able to collect 50% uh, of that $300. And until July 25th, they would also be eligible for the $600 on, in addition to that. And uh, so a number of employers are using that. That program is very um, manual. It has not been automated. And uh, it's um, one of the things that we are working on. We've received um, questions from people about what are the kind of programmatic enhancements that you're working on. Um, we've put together a small cross-department team to help work on the, the work share program because we think it has a lot of uh, promise for both workers and employers during this time as we're, as we're going into um, reopening. Um, so the other thing that we've been um, getting questions on, and I see it just popped up in the, in the chat, is uh, what's happening with work search waivers with the reopening? So we have a, a tiered um, work search um, dates coming up, if you will. So if you are permanently out of work, you don't have an anticipated recall date with an employer, even if you're not sure what that date is, um, the work search waiver is in place until July 11th. So that means starting the, the week beginning July 12th, um, those individuals would need to be looking for work and reporting their work search on their weekly certification. Uh, if you are someone who is connected to an employer um, and with expecting to go back to work for that employer, the work search is waived in accordance with Maine's um, emergency declaration. So that runs through July. The emergency legislation that was enacted um, added a 30-day window onto that. So that work search waiver is in place until uh, the week ending August 8th. And we are putting that information up on our website and um, beginning to 
Um, you know, we've done some press releases around this as well, just to get people um, thinking about it through this lens again, as you all know, in order to be eligible for unemployment insurance, the kind of core principles are you must have lost your job through no fault of your own, you must be able to work, you must be available to work, and you must be actively seeking work. And during the pandemic, that actively seek seeking work um, was one that it, it just um, didn't make sense. It was contradictory to what we were um, advising what people were being advised to do for their public health so that a uh, waiver was put in place. Um, but normally when you register for unemployment insurance, you also open a, uh, an account that is um, connected to the main job link. Um, and that's normally just um, something that's required to happen. Uh, we have not required that during the pandemic. Um, but it, it's been optional and many people are using it, which is great. Um, but that is one of the pieces that people will need to start doing if they haven't already opened a job link account. They should be thinking about doing that. The jobs are posted there on a regular basis. There's a way for both the employee to do a search of what are the possible jobs available. Um, we have had um, flags on certain jobs that are um, like very uh, essential jobs during this pandemic. Um, there was also as, um, I think there's a green job flag on there now as well. Uh, there are some good opportunities. I think we had at least 10,000 jobs listed on the job bank uh, last week. Um, and this is an opportunity for people to search through that, to do some uh, thinking about their resume, um, and also by working with the Career Center staff, do some exploration about what they might um, be interested, what that next phase might look like, especially if, as Kim said, um, your job has ended and you're not sure um, what that next job is going to look like for you. Um, we want to make sure that we provide as much help and support as we can. Also, our staff, um, from the Bureau of Employment Services has been conducting regular um, Zoom rapid response sessions. Uh, and those rapid response sessions help people think through not just unemployment insurance, but also, you know, what are some of the jobs that are available and what are the training opportunities that may also um, be of interest to people. I think the next thing we did want to mention, because we have received lots of questions uh, about BIW and the, um, and the strike, and I just wanted to let you know that we have spoken to both the union and management, um, and we're gathering information in order to make a determination um, later this week about what impact um, that has on someone's eligibility for unemployment insurance. So this is coming. Um, there were some other questions we received that didn't kind of fall neatly into any of the buckets that I've um, that we've been walking through. And I think one of them was around pensions, Kim. Sure, I'll take that one. So pensions should always be reported on your initial claim, your initial application for benefits, as well as on the weekly certification. And we do, that's another area where we have to hold a fact finding because whether your pension affects your unemployment benefits uh, depends on the, the type of pension. So uh, off the top, Social Security does not impact your unemployment benefits. There is no offset there. If you, um, if you as the individual, contributed more, 50% or more towards the, um, to, to the con contributed to the fund, then there is no offset for your unemployment benefits. However, if your employer contributed more than 50%, the, um, the amount of the pension that you receive, and so this is where it gets a little confusing, the percentage that the employer contributed, um, and then that percentage of your weekly, your pension benefit is reduced from your unemployment. So it, that's kind of a awkward so way of we'll saying say it, but so if you receive the equivalent of $200 a week in a pension benefit, and your employer contributed 75% of that, 75% times the 200 pension benefit is 150, your unemployment benefits would be reduced by the $150. Uh, 
Um, and so the caveat there is that if you are receiving a pension from an employer who is not in your base period, so not an employer that you work for within the last roughly 18 months, there is no impact. So if someone retired many years ago, began collecting a pension and then went to work somewhere else and now has been laid off, that pension would not be um, affecting their unemployment benefits. But that is why we have to hold a fact-finding interview for pensions to determine what is the impact on unemployment benefits. One of the other questions we get um, is volunteers who are working at the, the polls. So depending on the type of work that you're doing and how you're being compensated, that may or may not affect your benefits. So the volunteers who are, are working, for instance, at the town office and receive a, a nominal amount, um, that is not included in income uh, and would not need to be reported. But if you're somebody who is you know, um, trying to get signatures and um, are paid, for instance, per signature, that is definitely income and would need to be reported on your weekly certification. Okay, I think with this, do we want to go to some of the questions that are up here, Jess? I think that's the... Okay, so uh, there's a question here. Constituent talked to a deputy to follow up with her claim. He was waiting for more information from previous employer. Any ballpark time frame? on how long it will take to get a decision? Uh, based on that, it's hard to, to right. make a, it's hard to answer that question, not knowing um, what the circumstances are. But I think uh, people who are hearing decisions are trying to write them as quickly as possible. So, um, What's the next, with the next stage of reopening, what is the status of work search? I think yeah, we answered that. that. Uh, and then there's a question about pensions, which uh, uh, I think you answered, I although. I did, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, we can get the information on pensions in writing. Um, I will look and see what we have available. Uh, it is in statute, and the, the statute is incredibly complex. It, it, I had to reread it several times, and um, we can certainly make that reference available for you, and then any other uh, documents that we have on that. Does the 82.5% of the people who receive benefits include people who got all their pay or some of their pay? That would, Go ahead. That would be um, who received some pay. Mm -hmm. Was there anyone on the phone who had a question? I don't hear any. Okay. What is it? Uh, she also asks when you'll be done with the floor rollover. Uh, I think it's hard to put a date on that. Um, we're, we're moving through those unique circumstances as quickly as we can. I think we've done the ones that are easy to identify as a group of people. Some of them may be done, need to be done on a case by case basis. Right. Yeah, and I, I think now we're starting to get individual questions because uh, there's one, why might a person receive a payment and then none sense? I mean, I, I think we have to get specific information about that person. There's not a, there's not a, oh, we have a whole bunch of people that that's happened to. Um, so it sounds like it's a unique situation. I think one thing I would encourage people to do is to make sure people are filing their weekly certifications. We see a large number of people who have not filed weekly certifications, uh, and that is the trigger that, um, that pays the benefits.
again, again, in, it, we, we can't respond to individual circumstances um, that, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to, we can't speculate. Right. Because that's all it would be is speculation. So this is Shana on the phone. Just to follow up on the, the backlogs, for people who have exhausted benefits, who've started to see benefits, and they're very grateful for the benefits moving forward, I do want to emphasize that. We need to clarify for them that the system for them to get their back pay pursuant to the, P, to the exhausted benefits is not yet in place, and we, we're not exactly sure when that's going to happen. We have started to roll enroll people who have exhausted their state unemployment into the PUA program. Uh, again, we're moving folks over to that program in batches. And that just started within. Yeah, no, I think, I think Senator Abello's question was slightly different. Okay. Kim, I think it was, these people have rolled into PUA. They're concerned that they should really be in the F, um, in the PEUC program. And that that is because on the PUA, they're going to get the 172 and their, their benefit would be higher than that. Actually, folks that have exhausted their state unemployment are receiving their, their normal weekly benefit under the PUA program. Mm -hmm. but, so actually, my question is different than both, but thank you so much. Because <laughs> actually, that's, the, that's super, you know, all of this information is helpful for us to help constituents. Um, so I have people who've been rolled into PUA they're they were the exhausted benefits cases. They were some of the oldest cases that I had. But no one that I have who, ha who was an exhausted benefits case, meaning that they were unemployed before the pandemic, their benefits had exhausted, and then thought that they were going to start to get benefits. Now they are, but they haven't seen any retroactive weeks since dating back you know, like say they started two weeks ago, one woman, for example, she's getting it now every week, but she hasn't seen anything for May or for April. Um, and I've got a few people in that category. I think we would have to look into that one. And, and I don't know if everybody could hear the question. The question was, is for folks that have exhausted their state unemployment, who we have in fact enrolled in the PUA program, they are receiving current weeks of PUA benefits, but not the, the retroactive weeks. And we will look into that. So if someone's in that category, they should, we should, as their elected representatives, keep them on the list for elevation um, and sort of pursue that a little bit more deeply with all of you. Yes. Okay. yes. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and then my other question about the tickets, I was the one that asked about the number, the back, my question really was stemming from the backlog of tickets. I, I, I feel like I understand the system. I've talked to a lot of, not a lot, but a few employees who express frustration that there's some pretty old outstanding tickets, some on policy issues, but some on individual cases, and there's just nothing that the MDOL employee can do until something is fixed in the computer system. So do you have recommendations for those cases? I know I have at least one of them um, that, that is in the system where by all accounts, the tier two reps believe that his claim should have processed weeks ago and it just seems to be stuck and there is a ticket out on it, but um, he hasn't gotten relief. Yeah, Senator, I, I mean, those are the um, kinds of situations that we look at on a regular basis and are uh, actively working on. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that continuing to elevate that, you know, to keep those people on your list is good, but it's not as though the ticket is gone into a black hole and no one's paying attention to it. Um, those are the issues that we're working on regularly. Um, and then one last question is, um, I have a couple of people who seem to have been tagged for fraud. They went through the identity review and yet 
um, their claims have not yet restarted. Um, these were people who were tricky cases who were elevated through our offices and resolved by your team, for which we are very grateful. But cases that in some weeks took, I mean, in some cases took more than weeks, it took months, and now suddenly they're stalled again post-fraud, even though they're definitely real people. And, and we've done the identity verification. I, I think, Senator, those are ones that I'd like to have the names on, so please feel free to send those to us. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I think we're at about time if there are no other questions. Um, I hope this has been helpful for folks. Um, we plan to um, use, continue to use this format if it's, uh, if it's useful. Um, we want to make sure that we get information to you as, um, as quickly as we can and uh, as transparently as we can. Um, we are updating our FAQs on a regular basis, um, encourage people to go to the website. Also, I think today, Kim, we rolled out a chat bot. Yes, on our uh, main.gov slash unemployment page, there is a, a new chat box. It's a little blue box that will appear in the bottom right corner. Um, it is, um, it is, it's not a, a lot, not a live chat, but it is pre-programmed with a, a lot of the questions that we are asked frequently. So you can type in the answer and rather than the question. Having, well, you can type in the answer. Um, yeah, type in the question. And rather than having to scroll through all of those pages of FAQs, the, the chatbot will come back and, and give you the, the answer to your question. So mm -hmm. please check that out. Um, this is Sh this is Senator Bellows again. Just on behalf of the Labor Committee, I know a number of my peers are on the committee are here, and I know a number of my um, Senate colleagues and sent me questions and queries before this call. I just want to say it's very helpful. We really appreciate the hour that you're spending with us every week. So thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, and thanks for sending uh, the questions in ahead of time. That allows us to at least try to to group them and come up with. Um, hopefully useful answers. So thank you everyone. Thank you.